All right. So excited. Listen, you know when you have this kind of chatter, you know good things are happening and things are being born right now. And hopefully this turns into some very, very good future investments. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> wait, wait, what was that again? Hello? Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia Mulder. I'm the Director of Mission Driven Investments here at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And uh, like my colleagues, Rhea and Elandra said earlier, uh, just so honored and thrilled to have your presence here with us today. And for those of you who are with us earlier today at the workshop, again, a huge shout out to you all for uh, your great thinking and feedback and just really happy to bring this energy into tonight. Um, so this fantastic networking dinner, which my colleagues here have done a fabulous job of organizing, really culminates 13 months of a deep dive around how can we um, collectively drive more capital into the US South. And as Rhea mentioned, we had planned this to be a tour <laughs> in person, um, but we make do. We work around, because that's what we do um, at the Kellogg Foundation and certainly down here um, in the South. But tonight, we have an incredible panel, as I don't think these wonderful people need any more introductions. They're fantastic. But tonight, we're really just talking about What's driving us all? And we hope to leave you with inspiration to continue these conversations and the connections that you're, you've created here tonight, to continue to reflect on how each one of us individually can drive uh, mind shifts um, in action and hopefully more investments into the region. So to my left here, we have, who is this? Uh, Lejeune Montgomery Tehran, uh, the president and CEO of the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, Charles King, uh, the president and founder of Macro. Um, and Judy Reese Morris, who is uh, the president of the Louisiana National Urban League, or Urban League, as well as our representative on the Southern Communities Initiative. And uh, we tonight are going to talk a little bit about what brings us all to this, this conversation. Why? are we, we collectively focused on racial equity and investments in the South? And maybe we'll start with you, Lejeune, and talk a little bit about, we've heard a little bit about our commitment at WK Kellogg Foundation, but can you talk a little bit about your own journey and how it inspires the work that we do here at the foundation? Good evening, everyone. And you know, before I get started, I want to just say the WK Kellogg Foundation is made of about 220 outstanding, phenomenal individuals. And this gathering and a lot of the work that we do comes from the brilliance of, of all of us. So I'm just uh, the leader of a very, very talented organization. So thank you, Cynthia, and thank you for all of our WKKF staff here who have really carried the water for our mission and our values. So thank you all. So my personal journey, why am I so committed to this? Of course, I'm from the South, right? Uh, uh, my parents came from Clarksdale, Mississippi. And yes, Cahoma County. Um, and by way of you know Mount Bayou, Mississippi, who you know was founded by Isaiah T. Montgomery, of which I'm a descendant. Uh, so my history and my legacy runs deep in, in Mississippi. But when I joined the Kellogg Foundation, I was actually this accountant, a finance person from Michigan, because I was actually born in Detroit, Michigan. And you know, I thought my career was going to be about accounting and finance. Uh, and after probably about my first 10 years at the foundation working in that space of finance, um, I was given an opportunity to lead the programming efforts for our Mississippi programming. Now, what honor is that to be of a place and be given an opportunity to truly lead the work in improving the lives of those who are still in that place? And, and that was the opportunity that I was given. Um, and I have just been tremendously 
grateful and feel a total deep responsibility of making sure that this work mat the work matters, uh, not only in Mississippi, but in the South and everywhere where we do this work. So I've been at the Kellogg Foundation 36 years now. Um, and as I travel, <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, but as I track our work in the South, it, it is really part of our legacy. As you've heard earlier, we've been in the South for decades, right? This isn't anything new. And one of the earliest investments that we began to make was with smallholder farmers, where we were coming into the South in our agricultural portfolio trying to make sure that the family farmers were creating sustainable wealth building for their own families and then commercially within the region. And those were the kind of connections we made in the South, always very community driven and about improving the lives of families for children and communities. And that has grown to work that we are doing now uh, very comprehensively across education, workforce, economic equity, health equity, really beginning to think about what it takes to improve generations, one generation over another. And I want to give you a couple of quick examples of, of what bold investment for us looks like. Because one of the things we're going to talk about today is how we continue to invest courageously and boldly into this space and take, you know, leadership positions and pa pave new pathways. And I want to talk about a, an investment we made uh, in Bill Bynum because we think about great leaders. Uh, <laughs> And a long time ago, in 2001, or earlier, really, we forged a partnership with Bill Bynum. Uh, and actually, in 2001, we made a $20 million investment in his institution. And it was because of his leadership, as well as his institution, that helped us understand how you can actually put capital in places where people of color could access that capital. And you can build housing, you can build entrepreneurship, you can build business practices. And, and that's what our partnership has been with Hope Credit Union and before that Hope Enterprise uh, Corporation. And Bill, I think it's been a few, ECD, there have been all these different transformations of this institution that is has been wildly successful in our minds as far as really connecting in community and building this work uh, and building really the institution of a CDFI. Uh, and Bill, you were a, a trailblazer in that space. So we thank you. But our bold investment was not only in the institution, but in the leader. And that's what it's going to take for some of us to really step into these places in great partnerships and, and forge new partnerships and move the work forward. Uh, the second thing I'll say very quickly as far as a, uh, another investment that we made, when we created our MDI portfolio, uh, we went to our board and we told our board we needed our investments to matter. We wanted them to more, be more mission aligned. We didn't quite know that the industry was new, but we said, give us 100 million, and we think we're going to make double and triple bottom line investments. We're not only going to have returns, we're going to improve community, and we're going to build wealth. So that was the premise, and they said, go for it. Uh, and they said, go for it so fast, we were like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> we, ha we had an approval. <laughs> We had an approval and no plan. Uh, but what we did immediately was we took some of that 100 million and we just divided it up and we invested it in all the CDFIs that we knew and had partnerships with because we knew that until we could come up with a plan, those CDFIs were already organized and structured in a way where that money would make a difference in community and impact people's lives and businesses immediately. And we also met Southern Bank Corps. I don't know if someone's here from Southern Bank Corps, but that was one of our, yes, one of our investments was in Southern Bank Corps. We started that relationship with those investments. But we were nimble and we knew we wanted things to matter, and we're going to talk more about 
some of the pillars of Southern communities initiatives. And one of it is a CDFI strategy. How do you put capital in places that actually make sure that people of color have access to the capital and the capital is building wealth and is sustaining communities? So that's just two examples of the why. We, the why is because we want to impact the lives of children and families and we want to work with partners that are making the reach that makes a difference and matters. That's right. That's right. Charles. Boy, I have to follow the June. I don't I'm even sorry. know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I see why you said you're sitting here. <laughs> All right, so the why for me, I, I grew up in Decatur, Georgia, and um, just grew up there. I went to college in the South as well. I went to Vanderbilt University for undergrad. Growing up as a young black man in the South during that time, really experiencing much of the same experiences as so many um, people, black and brown communities experience around um, racial injustice and issues around kind of policing and, and even as a young man on a college campus and you know campus security and all of those things. I had this drive, this uh, you know, really strong kind of inclination to get into civil rights and activism. Uh, through some of the experiences I had, it also led me into the entertainment industry while I was in college, where I started making extra money, doing commercials and things like that. And then really from what really the way my interest and my why coalesced together was, someone was saying, you're, you're studying political science, you're at Vanderbilt, and you obviously have an interest in entertainment. Have you ever thought about entertainment law? I had no idea about entertainment law, but I remember this image of a show I used to watch with my mother called L.A. Law. Yes. And, it was a yes. and that character played by Blair Underwood. Yeah. And, yes, yes, yes. And that aha moment that I had of seeing this aspirational, strong black man who was standing up for himself that was like convicted, I was like, wow, like that guy. And so it sent me down a path to end up uh, you know, studying law at Howard University. And, and, while, and while at Howard, my interest around uh, community, civil rights, entertainment, media, and business all came together around the idea of building a media company one day that would you know, be a part of shaping culture, creating images that would uh, uplift our communities and be a, cr a positive business uh, for our community, but while at the same time reinvesting back into our community. And so my why and my path took me to Hollywood where I landed at the venerable William Morris Agency and became the first black partner in the history of Hollywood. at one of the major talent agencies. And so for years acted like basically the conductor of the Underground Railroad, <laughs> basically. <laughs> in, in the talent agency world, unlocking doors and opportunity and economic things with people that are unimaginable, including people like Tyler Perry, which people wonder, like, how does he own his own studios from the deals that I structured with his lawyer yeah. way back then. Right there. His vision. His vision for sure, but then he had a, he, there was a brother on the inside who understood what his plan was yeah. as a partner. So I would say I always knew that that was step one, but step two was the jump out of that, which I did uh, eight years ago to launch a company called Macro that I'm the founder and CEO of that, that finances and produces content across all platforms, film, TV, and television. And part of what we're doing is we're, we're changing the narrative of content. And we've had lots of productions, several of which have shot here in, in New Orleans that have gotten lots of acclaim. And many of them are shot in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're really about uplifting underserved voices and making sure s stories are told from this community by that community and, and then making sure that the economic side of their upside is shared in ways that traditional studios don't do that. And I will hats off to the Kellogg Foundation for being one of the earliest investors in our, in our fund and uh, also to many others here in this room who've been supportive, including BlackRock, who led our most recent round, as well as Emerson Collective, who've been partners from day one. So that's, nice. that's part of my why. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> All right. It is really an honor for me to be here. And I really love this question uh, because I have a lot of whys uh, as I look back and I think about 
think about my life. But my first why starts at the beginning with my parents. My mother, um, who sadly is uh, no longer with us, uh, helped adults to get their GEDs. She also, in her life when she worked, uh, was a home health care assistant. So she was always working with and always around individuals who were striving, who had had a lot of challenges in their lives, in their family situations, uh, but still had a hope and still had a vision uh, for themselves and for their families. My father uh, was a freedom rider during the civil rights movement and was in 1970 one of the first African Americans to get a professional job at City Hall in New Orleans city government. That was the year when then Moon Landrieu uh, was mayor, was elected mayor, and had run on a platform of promising to start to create equity. And that took the form and the shape of opening the doors to City Hall. Can you imagine what that must have looked like in New Orleans, um, as my father describes it? Uh, so my why is definitely them. Uh, you know, whether your kids realize it or not, uh, they're watching you uh, and they're looking to emulate you and, and what you do. And unbeknownst to me, I have found myself now as the head of the Urban League of Louisiana, um, a job that I didn't see in my future, uh, but that I'm so honored and privileged uh, to sit in and to serve and to lead an organization that has such a tremendous civil rights history and legacy. Uh, especially here in New Orleans. We are celebrating 85 years of service. Thank you, thank you. 85 years, think about that. And I have been thinking about that uh, for a long time as we worked our way to this year and now that we're in the year. Think about what it has taken for a civil rights organization in the deep south state of Louisiana albeit New Orleans, which is different than the rest of the state, but nonetheless, still in the state of Louisiana, to figure out how to do the work that we do and keep its doors open for 85 years. That, that will make you think about your why, and it will make you think about what you are doing, the, the legacy that you are upholding, and the work that is in front of you to lead. And so, you know, when I think about the work that we do, whether it's education and youth development, workforce development, entrepreneurship, health equity, and a host of policy issues, any quality of life issue is an issue that the Urban League of Louisiana deals with. I really think about the people, the single mothers, the returning citizen fathers, the children who are in failing D and F schools and have no other options, the aunts and the uncles who are either unemployed or underemployed, the grandparents who are suffering physically and mentally because they don't have access and they have historically not had the opportunity to be able to have access to adequate health care. Those are all of the people that we have the honor of serving through our work at the Urban League of Louisiana. So that is definitely the why. There's no way that you can't think about racial equity and what it means and why we need it, and also the promise of what it can lead to without thinking about the people that you serve every day. The, the way that we get there, though, is just as important, because it's one thing to have the passion and to have the vision and the hope but you have to have a vehicle to actually advance this work, to actually cause for some movement. And that is a part of my job that I'm really, 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 every day I grow more and more excited about. I do have also the honor of serving as the lead partner for the Southern Communities Initiative. You heard Lejeune talk about it earlier and describe it. Some of you are very familiar with it because we've had meetings about it and we've introduced you to Mambu Sherman. Mambu, just stand up so everybody can really see you well, please. Stand up. 
Mambu is the executive director, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant young brother who is now leading this enormous body of work. As you heard Lejeune tell you, in six cities here in the American South, and I'm really excited because this is a vehicle. SCI, much like this initiative, uh, is looking for investors. We, together, are looking for investors. We need people who will look at the projects and the initiatives that have been well-researched, well-vetted, and identified, and are ripe and ready to go. These are opportunities here in New Orleans that have been created by homegrown New Orleanians, and their work is great, but we need more of it. The impact needs to be greater. And so we have created uh, this relationship that we are working together on to connect investors to these projects, these initiatives, and always available to, to talk about it, but just really, really think it's important for us also to think about the why and the how. We need both of those in order to really advance the work. love it when your panel does the, all the work for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've, you've heard this thread, right, around narrative. A lot of this work is around narrative. I've been at the foundation now seven years, and one of the things that I have been privileged to experience is an organization that really values the role that narrative plays in everything we do. It's funny because I'm on the investment side, right? I'm, I'm supposed to just look at deals and get the deals done, right? You don't talk about them, you can tell stories. But when you come to the foundation, it's about really changing people's understanding and framing around what it means uh, to be a facilitator of opportunity. And so I'm gonna start with you, Charles. Because, I mean, obviously. Um, but talk a little bit about narrative and how that came to be in macro. And, um, and also, I got to just say, macro was the first transaction I looked at when I joined the foundation. <laughs> I remember that deck, no judgment. Um, <laughs> but, but to see the role that narrative, like, because you know why? The deck wasn't, the deck was OK. But it was talking to Charles and hearing the story that made the difference. Because I mean, they sent me the deck and I was like, oh, maybe, well, maybe I need to get on the phone with them. And, and listening to the story was incredible. And so can you talk a little bit about yeah. narrative and how yeah. that plays into how you guys are thinking about these, these investments yes. and how it's really playing out in the broader, yeah. the broader space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first off, in, sitting inside of, um, the belly of the beast of a talent agency, which is at the center of everything, the, 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 the films and television shows, what gets packaged, uh, the, the talent that gets cast in them, and how projects are being set up out in the marketplace. The talent agency, uh, they're, they're sitting at the center of that. So I had a you know, front row view of really you know, what was happening the, the, in, and how artists were being represented. And frankly, that none of the traditional studios, the newer independent uh, financing companies, that they were not focused on telling stories that represented the spectrum of the community, that represented a huge segment of our community that's driving ticket sales. I mean, you know, the person of color makes up about 50% of, of everyone that buys a ticket to see a film, at least in the United States. Most of the growth for, for the film industry has been internationally, including all the growth for all the streaming platforms, and most of the international marketplaces are driven by people of color globally. Um, yet, I'd say less than 10% of the films are focused there. And so it was clear that in every time I'd have artists, clients I represented in the agency world, have their movies open, whether it was Kings of Comedy or Barbershop or Tyler Perry's movies or I, I can't, 65% of the films during my time from 2000 to 2015 that did work that had, uh, you know, African-American leads or a multicultural lens where artists that I represented, I was involved in them. And they would always in, over index and perform because their audiences were thirsty and they needed, they wanted to see stories about themselves. And, but the people making all the decisions about everything that was getting made did not represent that audience. And they were deciding the arbiter of what projects were gonna get made. 
what those budgets should be and how they were going to be told and creatively as well as business wise. And also capping the business opportunity and limiting the value for those shows and the artists to travel with them internationally, therefore cre creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. So my vision was if I could launch a media company that could focus on this marketplace that was underserved, that was literally like a, a massive opportunity business wise, while at the same time building value taking market share from those that didn't under, that weren't willing to invest there, that it would then be a positive disruption to create more opportunity for others while creating a business and a vehicle that would be valuable to all the stakeholders and investors. And that's what happened. You know, when we launched the company, uh, it's say um, the month after that, the Oscar So White campaign happened. And then a couple of years after that, Oscar So White happened again. And, and what we've seen is that there are so many stories, just like you're saying with double impact in terms of projects or, or companies or things that you're investing in that do well, but also do, that do well financially, but also do good at the same time. What we're seeing with content for us is that we could have great content that would be entertaining and fun and inspiring, but that also at the same time could educate. Could, could, could show different sides, a reflection of who we are, could create value by investing in, in new storytellers that we're not getting in those opportunities. And that's what we've seen happen. And we all, what we've also seen is that same aha moment that I had, you know, with, oh, the, you know, my Blair Underwood story that I've told over and over is there's going to be aha moments all, all, all over the place from a lot of the content that has come, come about over the course of the last eight years. We were just talking about Abbott Elementary at, at dinner. I can't tell you there's going to be hundreds of teachers now that are going to be young, young, young students who are going to say, I want to be a teacher. I, I love what I saw with Abbott El Elementary. There's going to be thousands of scientists from this Siri character from Black Panther, you know, from that character. And, and what I've also seen happen is I've seen uh, content that builds bridges. And I'll give you one example. Mudbound, which is a movie that we shot here in New Orleans, it was the very first film our company financed and produced. It got four Oscar nominations. And Available on Netflix. The, the, the highest sale at Sundance Film Festival that year. And what we saw happen with that film premiering at the Sundance Film Festival was people from red states coming up and hugging Dee Reese, who is the, this brilliant, black gay woman director who is amazing. And her family, she had, her grandmother gave her her journals and notebooks about here's what it was like growing up in the South. Here are the images of what it was like for black families. And what we saw happen there was white families who owned land coming up and hugging Dee and the shared experiences of two families and the, the friendship that is this orchestrating in that film of a young white uh, man who's coming back from war and a young black man who's coming back from war and the bond that they had, it just showed the commonality. That's one example of like building bridges and showing the universality of who we are. That's one. Another one, one of our films was uh, with Fences with, with Denzel Washington and Viola Davis. That movie was not getting made. It was in development for 20 years at Paramount Pictures and you had Denzel Washington, August Wilson, Viola Davis, Paramount Pictures were refusing to make the movie unless someone else put up the capital. Macro and Braun Studios were the two companies that put up 75% of the equity for that film. It did, did, it was a good investment. Thank you, thank you. It did well. Viola won an Oscar, it got four nominations yeah. as well. But there were stories that came about it. I'm gonna tell you one. One of my really good friends is a guy named Reese Forbes, who is a blonde, blonde, white guy, professional skateboarder. And our, fan, our kids went to school together. And he probably wouldn't have seen Fences had it not been for his friend who produced and was one of the executive producers of it. But he went to go see the film in the theaters. And I remember him calling me up and he was almost in tears. And he said, Charles, this is the first time I've seen a movie or, or anything, any content where it showed what my relationship was like with my dad. Here is a white man with blue eyes and blonde hair, six foot tall, professional skateboarder. Like, I see my dad in Denzel Washington and myself and the guy that played Denzel Washington's son. And we can have more experiences like that, yeah. showing truly how we're really all yes. the same, right? Yes. Then, then those are other ways to build bridges and create a common bond. So narrative change is absolutely happening from the content, but it also created a ripple effect because there's been at least another 10 companies from diverse perspectives who went and raised capital 
after macro. Right. And now they're financing and we're financing things together and it's, it helped move the marketplace so you'll see more and more content. I know I'm, I'm getting a little signal that we're gonna oh, wrap up. talking too much, sorry. <laughs> but no, 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 but it's not a narrative. Oh, you need to say, something? okay, of course. It's so, so important and I'll be brief. When you said aha moments, so critical. Love the examples that you gave about real people and human experiences and the learnings that we can get. They're, av they're available, they're out there. But when we think about economic justice and when we think about all of the information that is faulty mm. and false mm. and wrong that's out there, then we really think about narrative change. Yeah. And we think about how critical it is to our economy, to uh, our growth and development as a city, as a region, as a state, as a country, as the demographics continue to change and we become more brown and black in America. It is so, so, so important to correct these falsehoods that exist. Mm -hmm. And so we are doing a body of work called Sea Change, S-E-E, -E, Change. Mm. Uh, it's a play on the phrase Sea Change, S-E-A, Change. We changed the S-E-A to S-E-E -E because we want to actually see the change, the work that we are doing. We want to mm. see it. We want to see it. We want our community to see it. And a large part of this work is narrative change. It has a huge narrative change component because it is so important, especially in the South, to educate people on what racial equity really means and what economic justice mm -hmm. really means. And so I said this to you earlier, Lejeune, of course, Rhea, Deidre, everybody in the W.K. Kellogg Foundation family, Dennis, who understands the importance of supporting narrative change work. The W.K. Kellogg Foundation did a report that has just been transformative for New Orleans and for Louisiana. Billions of dollars, billions of dollars of economic output being lost, left behind, not considered, not a factor because of racial equity, these inequities, the gaps that exist. So at the Urban League of Louisiana, we say that racial equity is an economic development strategy. It's an economic development strategy. Any economic developer worth his or her salt must look at the gaps that exist and must figure out how to fill those gaps, which is racial equity, by the way, because that is where the disparities exist. That's where the gaps live. You, you have to figure out how to close the gaps and then we can create this environment where economies can get stronger, people are able to fully participate in the economy, we deal with public safety issues, we deal with public education issues, we deal with health issues, a variety of issues. And so part of the work that we're doing with Sea Change is to help to, again, correct the wrongs that are out there about what it takes, what racial equity is and what it really takes for it to exist. It's not about taking a dollar out of your pocket and putting it in my pocket. It's about growth. It's about growing the whole. And it's about really understanding from an economic development standpoint, what it is going to take to really grow our economy for everyone. And so I thank you for this opportunity because I'm, I'm, we're really, really, really big on this idea of changing the narrative around what racial equity means and how we can achieve full participation for everybody in the economy. So yeah. thank you. The June, do you want to talk a little bit about narrative change and how we think about it and how we, we hope that it is embedded in everything that everyone in this room does moving forward. <laughs> sure, and I will add to that. I'll plus you by also talking about the call to action. Yes, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And how we want to continue this conversation much further than this gathering tonight. Um, 
But I want to just start out by talking a little bit about why would a Kellogg Foundation, you know, invest in narrative change? Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, I think a way of really describing how I think comprehensive and integrated grant making really works. Because you may say, you're focused on children, and we are, uh, but, and we have this DNA that I think undergirds everything we do. And our DNA is about leadership, the people that make the change, community engagement, the communities that sustain the change, mm -hmm. and racial equity. And that's about the structures mm -hmm. that either perpetuate inequality or create equality. And for us, when we think about racial equity, we know at the heart of racial equity is racial healing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have racial inequality partially because of the structures that divide us. And we're watching that play out even now. Uh, and racial healing is a practice, a way of relating to one another, a way of building trust, a way of coming together that can combat that destructive force of division and bring people together in very productive ways. And for us to get to racial healing, you got to combat that underlying narrative mm -hmm. that keeps us apart. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what our work is all about. When we created our racial equity and racial healing strategy, we had very specific intentions. It wasn't just, you know, to name these phrases, mm -hmm. but we had strategies behind them. And we knew that we needed to build new narratives in our nation that brought us together mm -hmm. and that helped us understand one another as opposed to the false narratives that keep us divided. We also had underlying strategies around policies that change the structures that divide us. We had a very much a policy agenda. We talked about community engagement as part of that strategy and, and the actions that then would occur when people work together in communities to build better systems for children and families to thrive. So we actually had all these intentional structures. And I just want to tell a story because when we started talking about narrative change, we, uh, we were speaking with you know, some of our contacts in the entertainment industry, and we were saying we wanted to endeavor on this, in this space of narrative change, and they were like, do you know Charles King? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, well, not really, and so we were connected to Charles King, and they were like, well, you gotta work with Charles King. And so we wanted to have this first meeting around narrative change. And they said, well, if you work with Charles King, you know, you may be able to have such a meeting in the entertainment industry. So we went to Charles yeah. and we asked him if we could, you know, if he could assist us in having a meeting in the yeah. entertainment industry with a few people that he may know to help us understand this issue of narrative change. Charles brought the most prominent, prolific people in the entertainment industry that exist. And whenever we spoke with one of them to invite them, they were like, Charles King, I'll be there. Uh, <laughs> Simple as that. Awesome. If Charles said this is an important meeting, I will attend that meeting. And we had one of the most productive meetings around narrative change, thanks to your great uh, guidance and assistance. So, but that's... And I say that to transition to collaboration uh, and why we're having this meeting and why we are all gathered. Nobody or no one entity can make the kind of significant transformative change that we're talking about making in children's and families' lives in the South or all over this nation and the world. It takes great partnerships. It takes the leverage of all of our expertise and our great wisdom and guidance to get this done. And we realize this at the Kellogg Foundation. We're one foundation, uh, but the strength and the power of this room even today and uh, the strength that we can have when we work together, uh, and that's kind of the underlying premise behind how we can significantly change the lives of 
a whole region like the South, for example. Mm -hmm. That's how that makes that really possible and palpable that this can actually really happen. And that's why we want to continue to have these kind of partnerships and work with all of you. Because, you know, we just left, we took our board to South Africa. We were just in South Africa last week and we had this great, uh, very moving leadership session. And we were all uh, taken to the Apartheid Museum and, and we were looking at all of Nelson Mandela's quotes and, and reflecting on his great leadership. And of course, my favorite quote, it was Nelson Mandela quote that says, it, it always seems impossible until it's done. Uh, and that's uh, really uh, a quote for me that really guides how I think about this work. Um, it's impossible until it's done. And the visions that we have around like Southern communities initiatives, for example, where you're saying we're gonna leverage all the commitments from corporate America since George Floyd, and to take those commitments and channel them in a collective coordinated fashion to change the game for capital access and investment in the South and to uh, build HBCUs as an asset. a pipeline for workforce for the world, uh, to look at digital divide and to eliminate it and build the kind of technological infrastructures in our people and our places. I mean, that may seem huge, but it's not. It won't be when it's done. And that's what we can do together. So this call to action tonight is just, uh, this is more than a gathering. It's about our collective power it's about the shared vision that we can have, and it's about the many, many lives we can impact in uh, not only the South, but it can be then a model for all over the nation and the world. So we invite you all to stay grounded in this space, to continue to work with us together. There are many, many opportunities we're gonna have as investors and partners to change the world. So it, doesn't, it starts tonight, but it, it's, it's a long lasting endeavor that I hope we can all be a part of together. So thank you. That's it. Is it obvious why I love my job and the organization I work for? Um, I just have to give a huge shout out to this panel um, and to all of you today. We have been, like I said, last 13 months digging deep, getting to know each other, connecting the dots. And we hope that this day and this in-person, you know, we're not on Zoom anymore for those who are in the workshop, um, really catalyzes uh, next steps, right? And we see more, uh, more opportunity. So I just, again, Judy, Charles, Lejeune, thank you so much. And thank you for your leadership and guidance. Thank you. And, thank you. and showing us what's possible. And we hope to continue that through each one of us. And I also just want to give a shout out to my amazing colleagues who brought us all here today. Just thank you. And uh, we, uh, I'm not gonna get in the way of dessert, so dessert is coming. <laughs> we will be sharing um, all of the great insights and lessons um, on SCI, on ROI with you guys. I think we've got everybody's contact information, so don't worry, we've got more coming. And um, thank you, and enjoy. Yeah.